There is a lone candle that's still lit on the table, even into the darkest hours of the morning. He will sit on one side, rolling the last bit of tea around the bottom of his cup. She will sit with hers full and continue to stare at him. She hopes her husband has an answer, and yet she knows in her heart he doesn't. They will glance back at the table at the list of names and the page filled with the numbers. And they will look back at each other. And it seems like an eternity where no one says a word. They don't have to. They are both living out their greatest nightmare. Through a small doorway with a simple tapestry covering it, their only daughter sleeps. Tomorrow's supposed to be the happiest day of her life. Tomorrow starts a new chapter, a new family. She's been given for quite some time. Tomorrow's the actual ceremony. And they both know if everyone on this list shows up, this will become an embarrassment she will never live down. And after all these years of doing their best to raise her, this is where it will end. Sleep won't come. The morning will be filled with family and friends coming over even before the dawn. Plenty of last minute things to do, flower arrangements, colors, little swaths, doily things, potpourri, tables set, yard still swept out. Everything has been clean. A checklist has been made for weeks, but, but this is the day. And one by one, they start to arrive. And mom and dad has a calculator going. They showed up. Oh, they showed up. Oh, they brought friends. And they brought a guest. And they brought a guest. And before they know it, the small celebration has swelled. And the, rock, the wine has run out. And the party will end. And people will go home. A celebration that should last for days will end prematurely. They've tried to keep their daughter from knowing, we just don't have what it takes to pull this off. And word starts to spread. Mary has been invited. She already knows there's something different about her son. She knew from the beginning there was something different about her son. She wishes Joe was still alive to see the man that he's become. But when she understands the gravity of the situation, she simply tells the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Jesus reports to mom, this isn't yet my time for miracles. Mom ignores Jesus. The only one on earth I think could get away with that. <laughs> Looks at servants and says, do whatever he's about to tell you to, which puts Jesus in an incredibly awkward spot. Mom, I'm not doing a miracle. He's about to do a miracle. You just obey him. <laughs> do I follow heavenly father, earthly mom? This is awkward. What do you have? We have empty pots. Fill them with water and serve them. Jewish vases for ceremonial washing, perhaps 20 to 30 gallons each, are taken to the well, are filled with water. And somewhere in the process, somewhere in the moving and walking, servants dip the ladle in and it comes out crimson red and it starts to be poured. And those at the table and the disciples that Jesus brought with him knew what had happened, even though the rest of the party just momentarily realizes the wine supply is on pause. Oh, it's flowing again party continues. Daughter is on the dance floor with her friends doing some sort of line dance that most of people my age can't get involved with and she will never have a clue what's just happened at table 17 because a mom was invited. A son was asked to come and then he was allowed to work. And John will simply make a little note. This was the first demonstration of his heavenly power and all those with him truly bought in that this was the son of God from there the stories will race 
From there, it'll be page after page. From there, people, I'm telling you, there's visions and stories that I sit back and scratch my head and go, seriously? Seriously? Are we supposed to buy that? Is that how it happened? 5,000 people show up. Because of his teaching, they sit through breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and he tells the disciples, you better feed them. And the disciples understand the gravity of the situation. It would take half a year's salary to feed this crowd. We don't feed this crowd. We don't have that kind of food. And Jesus goes, well, how much do you have? How much do we have? Oh, like we forgot about the semi-trucks of food parked on back? How much do we have? I got this kid who's got a lunchbox. And Jesus takes it and gives thanks. Isn't that amazing? I'll take what little you have. I'll take your insecurity. I'll take your doubt. I'll take your fear. And in my hands, I'll give thanks for such things when they're given to me. And 5,000 are fed. And there's baskets of leftover. And every town and every city seems to have a story around a tiny little sea up here called Galilee, around a tiny little body of water, just primarily the northern section. It is village after village after village, no more than 150, 200 people for almost every city, small little pueblos of land. And blind men can now see. Crippled men can now walk. Those with leprosy have now got skin that they show off on a daily basis. A 12-year-old girl is trying her best to catch up in sixth grade. She's missed a month and a half of school with fever, with growing weak, with death, although no one mentions that. He's protected that as well. She's simply sleeping. And when he raised her from the dead, he let everyone in the house, no, don't tell anyone outside what I've just done. She had fallen into a coma, a deep sleep. But, but if it's your mission to tell people you're the son of God, if it is your mission to let people know that God came to earth, kick the door open, let the funeral outside that has been started, let them know you have the little girl, you're holding her. She was dead. You know it, you know it, you know it, you know it, you know it. Tell her for yourself. I was dead. This is quite a road show. Take her on tour with you. Let her be the opening act. Let mom and dad come out and simply start a story about when their 12-year-old died, about sending a father out, even though he was a synagogue ruler, even though he was opposed to this teaching of Jesus, who seemed to be making a mockery out of the Old Testament, saying that he was the Messiah, Messiah Christ, this one you've been waiting for for 400 years since the close of the Old Testament, this one that would come on the clouds with superhuman power, you don't, you don't fit the bill. And yet when it's your 12-year-old girl who hasn't been able to eat, when it's your 12-year-old girl that labors in breathing, when it's your 12-year-old girl with sunken cheeks who can't afford to lose much weight, and when you hear stories about blind and crippled and lame and paralyzed, now healed, you will sit out and look. And when he finally brings Jesus to the house too late, mom will leave a bedside. Even though a daughter has passed on, mom's post that she refuses to leave. And for the first time she will stand and bury her head into her husband's broad chest. He will grab her by the back of the neck, the small of the waist. And she will finally let go of the sobs. And for the first time, he will see her. Without motion. Without breath. Peter, James, and John are allowed to stand in the corner of the house. They know they're intruding on the most private of areas. And Jesus will slip beside the embrace, touch the cold fingers. Talitha kaume, in Aramaic, little girl, get up. And breath comes back into her body. And he helps her to the side of the bed and the stand. And mom and dad are filled with, mom, mom and dad are filled with uh, adjectives we don't have words for. What are you filled with when you see your child come back from the dead? Is it horror? 
Is it shock? Is it disbelief? Is it wonder? Is it joy? Is it awe? It's all encompassing. And in the silence is where Jesus gave that command. Don't let anyone know. She's 12. And if word gets out, she's come back from the dead. In this culture, she's untouchable. I've saved her to a life that is no life. No life. She'll never be allowed to play in games at recess. She will sit by herself in school if she's allowed in the class. She will grow old alone. She will find herself in the marketplace as a woman, once again shopping for one, only to have a small little girl inadvertently run up and look what's in her basket. And the scene will be replayed that she has to live out a hundred times. A mom will grab the daughter and pull her back. Don't you ever go near that lady again. Look at that lady. That's the dead lady. And he knows. At prom, no one will dance with a zombie. He knows. And he doesn't care about his reputation. In chapter 5, he cares about her teenage years. Almost as if to say, I can handle my reputation. I also want to handle hers. She was in a coma. She woke up. Let her have life. I thought in reading the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books in the New Testament, we had all the stories of Jesus. Until you get to the very last of those books, John, the very last chapter, chapter 21, the very last paragraph, John simply says, it's time for me to stop writing. It's been 21 chapters. This is expensive and long. I just want to let you know, we haven't even scratched the surface of the miracles and the teachings of Jesus. If we got together and wrote down every day what he did, there's not enough books and not enough libraries in the world that would contain his stories. And no one ever told me that. When you put it all together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have about three months of Jesus' life. And there's over three years. It's not the miracles, though. It's not the power. It's the teaching. It's the type of teaching where he's telling crowds, this isn't a religion. This isn't a philosophy. This isn't a God you have to please. This isn't sacrifices you have to do. This isn't a list of rules that somehow you have to measure up to. And the moment you miss one, you start all over again. This isn't an angry God that is waiting to smite you. Therefore, here is the tightrope that you must walk. It is a Jesus teaching constantly about freedom and grace and mercy and walking in that and people can't get enough of it and big burly chested dock workers who row large wooden ships for a living leave everything and say that's the type of guy I can follow that finally makes sense here and here and for three years it's been building and it's been building and it's been building ever since the wedding in Cana in Galilee until that afternoon. Every city they walked into and every city they walked out of, every crowd they approached, every time he dealt with people, he is about to flip the script. He is about to do something completely contrary to anything they've ever seen or heard. And his disciples are about to get rocked. And he'll start with two of them. Um, You and you, come here. Okay, I need you to make your way through the crowd. I know the city is packed. I want you to get inside the gate. The very first car that you see, I want you to steal it. Drive it back out here. We're going to ride it back in. And the disciples have to be shocked. Seriously? This is very un Jesus like. <laughs> he goes, No, we're going to pull off Easter. We're going to do it differently. We're going to do it with the carjacking. Go. The two disciples walk in the city. As soon as they get inside the gate, there's a donkey tied up. Dang. <laughs> Jerusalem has swelled over 20 times its population. Every good Jewish family wants to come back to Jerusalem, the capital of Judea, the capital of Israel, to celebrate Passover, to remember that some 1,400 years ago, when your people were enslaved, 
in Egypt. That God ripped that nation apart simply to bring you back. That he brought Pharaoh to his knees. And the very last plague was an angel of death that would come over the city. If you put the blood of a lamb on the doorpost, whoever's in that house is saved. No blood of the lamb. No one will be saved. And the last plague hits Pharaoh's household. And the Jewish people are woken up in the morning with the sound of crying and wailing and are told to pack up and get out. They leave without having time to make anything for the journey. They take dough that doesn't have time to rise and they run. And for 1,400 years, your people have been celebrating this. The passing over. And everyone will come to the city and everyone will take a lamb And everyone will take it up to the temple and have it sacrificed. And every family will sit around with flatbread and bitter herbs to remind you the bitterness of slavery. And a little dish of salt water to remind you the tears that were shed. And a little mixture of date and cinnamon that looks like mud all crunched together to remind you you weren't slaves and you made bricks for the Egyptian empire. And every family will come in this city and gather. And at the end of every meal, the passing over, they will pick up a cup. And that cup is a promise that one day God will send Messiah man, Christ. One day God would send a redeemer. One day God would save you for good. And they've been doing this every single year. And in that city, on that day, for that celebration, for that cause, Jesus says, we're about to wreak havoc. Steal the donkey, bring it back out. The disciples untie it, start to leave. Someone goes, hey, that's my car. And they're like, the master needs it. And they just take off. (laughs) Not a stallion, nothing big, no big SUV, spinner hubs, nothing like that. (laughs) Not some fast quarter horse, not some race car, just just a donkey. It's a Prius. (laughs) Jesus went green, just Prius. They bring it outside the city. And with the crowds that are packed inside. Thousands upon thousands camp outside the city. You've all seen Survivor. You know how to make shelter if you have to for a night or two. You cut down palm branches. You lay them at an angle. You pray it doesn't rain. And you have shade. And everyone from the areas of the Galilee and the Getty and the Dead Sea have cut down their palm branches and they brought their building material up to Jerusalem because they know they and their family will have to camp out for this week. There's not enough room inside that city to contain. And when they see him riding on that colt, head and shoulders now above the crowd, heading in, they grab their palm branches, their building material, and they start waving them and laying down in front of them. And the disciples, the hair on the back of their neck stands up. This is what we've been waiting for. For the last three years of being mocked and laughed at. For the last three years of having religious leaders coming after us. For the last three years of having strong Jewish leaders opposing this idea that he's the Messiah. This is what we've come for. It's a fever pitch and electricity that starts to rivet all around Jerusalem. For as far as you can see now in these hills, you can see the man riding down above the others on his donkey. And that's the one you've been hearing about. That's the one that all the stories go back to. That's the one that the blind and the lame and the crippled and leprous and the walking on water and the feeding of the 5,000. That's the one they were all hoping for. That's the one for the last two months they've been wondering, do you think he'll show up? Oh, the synagogue leaders... Those that run the temple have put a price on his head. But do you think he would dare show up? On this day and this week where we and every household will stand and have a cup, God send your redeemer. This guy seems like he could pull something off. Messiah, Christ, do you think he could be? You're tired, aren't you? You're tired. A tiny little nation of Israel only about 130 miles long by about 40 to 60 miles at most at its width, a little sliver of land, no more than from the border up to Orange County, as far in as about Temecula. Sorry, Ramona, you've been left out. It is just a small little piece of land. And yet you've been a pawn in the major trade routes of the world empires. You've been traded by the Egyptians, by the Babylonians, by the Syrians, by the Greeks, by the Persians, and now by Rome. And for 1,400 years, you've been holding a cup. 
when are you going to bring someone? And in that city, at that time, for that day, he flips the switch. We don't walk in. We ride. And he has the attention of the thousands. Roman guards are quadrupled during this time. They know this is a crazy week. They know nationalism and patriotism and spirituality and religiosity is going to be at a fever pitch among their little servants, this Israel community. So I'm sure this catches Rome's attention. Palm branches down. A lane is being split. A parade is coming into town. And someone fills their lungs with breath and they let it out. Hosanna! And as Rome looks from where it came from, from the other side of the street, it's picked up. Hosanna! The crowd has been looking for something to do in this moment, and they've just found their chance. It's a mixture of two great Hebrew words, to save and now or quickly. And the crowd starts chanting, save now, save now, save now. As they get close to their town, someone will scream out above the rest, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the crowd cheers. <laughs> to come in the name of someone means to come in their power, their might, and with their authority. Save now. Save now. Bring the power of God. Save now. Save now. Bring the power of God. I imagine by the time they reach the gates, the house is built into the walls. As if the city needed something more. From a rooftop, it is yelled. Bring the coming kingdom of David. And it's like a spark that hits the powder keg and the streets of the city explode. The last time your little nation had freedom was under a king named David. It's been over a thousand years. You've been waiting. Save now. Save now. Come with power. Save now. Save now. Set up a kingdom. Save now. Save now. Kick Roman butt. Kick Roman butt. The crowd is chanting. Guards are now getting together and locking themselves into places. And Jesus simply walks into the temple, looks around. And the Bible says, because it was almost evening, he left and spent the night outside the city. Kind of an anticlimactic end to a parade. But I love it. Where does he go? One destination. Into the headquarters of those that have put a price on his head. Simply to look around. Oh, no doubt the temple courts have heard the ruckus from outside. The moment he steps between the columns and walks into one of the gates, it is dead silence. Simply to look around. And then he turns and leaves. One of the most strategic, bold, calculated moves in all of history. You've been looking for me? I'm in town. I'm calling the shots. I'll see you tomorrow. Mic drop. <laughs> Gone. For the next three days, there'll be questions from religious leaders trying to trap him. He'll get out of every one. But he's also getting out of the popular vote. He's not attacking religious leaders. He's not attacking Rome. In fact, he's not even speaking against Rome. In the crowded temple courts that would have held thousands at this time, several football fields long, the question is simply asked, do we pay taxes to Caesar or not? See, that's a brilliant question. If you say you have to pay taxes, the people are going to hate you. If you say don't pay taxes, Rome can kill you. And Jesus just simply says, give me a coin. Who's that on it? Well, that's Caesar. Well, why don't you give Caesar what's Caesar's? Give God what's God's. And everybody's like, dang, you're good. <laughs> but he loses the crowd. You're not going after Rome. You're not going after the religious system. Within a matter of days, the leaders know we could probably take him quietly. They will try him at night against all their laws, against all the rules of their judicial system. They will bring him out in daylight. 
and tell the crowd that they have set up. Who should we release? It's common this time. Rome would release a prisoner to be on good favor in a city that's a powder keg. And the crowd chooses Barabbas. He's a murderer. He's an insurrectionist. He's at least taken out a few Romans. This guy's taken out none. Give us Barabbas. What do you want me to do with this guy then? Crucify him. And he's beaten and stripped. He's whipped. He's mocked. He's hung on a cross. And his followers run. Three days later. I've always imagined him pacing back and forth inside a small tomb. (laughs) Wondering how many people are outside. He's told the crowd four different times on the way to Jerusalem. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over, beaten, whipped, spit upon, crucified. That's right, I'm going to allow them to kill me. After three days, I'm pulling off Easter. He's told them. Now he's got to be sitting there thinking, I've done every single thing I told them I would do. The only thing left is for the stone to be rolled away. I wonder how big the crowd would be. I wonder if there's a band outside just warming them up. Keep your eye on the stone. We aren't alone. Banging. Everybody's just waiting for Easter service. Stones rolled away. Jesus steps out. crickets (laughs) crickets <laughs> the bible says there's a gardener i can do it with a weed eater doesn't even know what's going on <laughs> he's like <laughs> and he has to go find them where does he find them they went back to fishing exactly where he found them a little over three years ago what do you do when jesus doesn't pay off the way you want them to pay off. You go back to what you were doing before. He doesn't hit them with lightning. He doesn't catch the boat on fire. In fact, he gives them a ton of fish. He sits on the beach. He says, do you really love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Then become part of this takeover. I don't care about Rome. I care about eternity. I came to save hearts. I came to save souls. I came to save lives, not Jews from Rome. Do you love me? Join the takeover. From that moment on, men who were afraid for their lives and ran, you can't shut up. Every single one of them will die for this truth. Not a single one will roll over. Not a single disciple or their family will say, whoa, 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 time out. We were all in the cave one night. We're doing some peyote. We started writing about a dude that could do miracles. It was great. We put it out there. Sorry, man, this has gone too far. Not a single one of them. We know what history is like. You see a cult. You see a bunch of lunatics. They're usually run by someone who is a lunatic. You kill the lunatic, you lose the cult. We've seen it all throughout history. They kill the lunatic. And this thing explodes and something happens right here in Jerusalem in this little podunk piece of land called Israel on the far eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean Sea within the Roman Empire. Something happens here that starts sending shockwaves across the known world and everyone starts hearing the story and everyone starts hearing about the power of Rome and one that allowed himself to be killed And walked away from it. And everyone starts hearing stories about walking on water. And the leprous. And the blind. And the diseased. And it is spreading like a firestorm. Why? Because God picked this dot. This place on the map. Where all things from Africa must come up and through. All things from Europe and Rome must come down and through. All things from what we nowadays would call Asia must come through. This is the center of the highways of the known world. And that's the spot that he picked. That's where he put his people. That's where he made his promise. And that's where he sent his son. And this now, at this time in this place. Why didn't Jesus show up 500 years earlier? Why was the Old Testament so long? Because God waited for the one time, the one place where all roads led to Rome. And all roads lead away from Rome. And the first century was the first time in history you could have one event, if it was centrally located, that would reach all people. And this thing explodes. 
And Jerusalem is rocked for two years. For two years, disciples are telling stories. For two years, Peter stands up one day and starts preaching, and 3,000 people give their lives to Christ. Why? Because they saw it. They were there. They heard it. They're not telling stories about somebody down in Arabia that raised from the dead. They're not telling stories about someone off in Taiwan who is a son of God who raised from the dead. They're not telling stories about someone out in Great Britain that pulled off miracles. They are telling the stories that everybody in this small little land saw for themselves, heard for themselves. There's the blind man. There's the leprous. There's the cripple. There's the 5,000. Ask them, ask them, ask them, ask them. He was killed in the capital. He pulled away the stone in the capital. And Roman religious leaders cannot produce a body. They cannot shut it up. And so it starts to explode. And you have the other side of the coin. You have people love God so much they want to kill Christians. I know that's weird, isn't it? You have an entire nation that loves God so much they want to kill Christians. That's the hatred. You've taken our word of God and you've claimed it was a mere carpenter who we killed. You are telling us we missed our entire religion. You're telling us we are that dumb. We are that clueless. And the line is drawn in the sand. Two years into it, Stephen has had enough. He's in a synagogue in Jerusalem. It's time for the reading of the scrolls. The young disciple's heart is racing. Beads of sweat have started to come together and they're pouring down his face. And he stands and he grabs a scroll and he reads. And he goes all the way back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He goes back to the promises given to these people some 2,600 years ago. He goes back to the very foundation of Judaism. And he goes to the Old Testament and he explains who God is and what he was doing and all of his promises. And at the end he said, and the Messiah showed up and you missed him and you killed him and you'll be judged for that. It's one of the best days in church ever. People went nuts. A couple are praising. Everyone else jumps on Stephen. They pull him outside in the streets. Everybody's like, why did church just explode? Do you know what this guy just said? And they start beating him all the way to the temple. They take him to the temple, and he does the exact same speech. They take him to a rock outside the front gates, about 15 foot up, and they throw him off. It's to debilitate you, not to kill you. It's so that something in your body would be broken or harmed. So those gathered below with stones could do the rest. Don't kill someone like that easily, everyone gets a shot. And as Stephen falls and is hurt, the stones come flying in. And everybody that wants a good shot takes their cloak off. And where do you put your valuable cloak? Saul. You can trust Saul. And they hand it to Saul. He's a young lawyer. He's got amazing education. He comes way up here from a place called Tarsus. He comes from a wealthy family. He's a first round division one draft pick, full ride scholar. He gets to come all the way down to Jerusalem and he goes to the number one training center for Judaism in the world. And he's hand instructed by Gamaliel. He's now part of your Supreme Court. Your 72 ruling elders. Oh, he doesn't have one of the seats yet, but he's next in line. He's a hotshot lawyer who has everything going for him, and he watches the cloaks. He makes sure nothing gets stolen from the pockets. Everyone will get theirs back. He watches Stephen die, and he watches the crowd join in, and he realizes this is my ticket up. No one has become a terrorist for God yet. That position's open. Oh, there's a lot of lawyers, there's a lot of smart kids, there's a lot of wealthy families. No one's a terrorist for God. So he simply asked religious leaders, can we continue this? we got to stomp out Christianity. It's been two years since that Jesus fellow has come and gone. And look what's happened to our city. And they gladly give him permission. You can jail, beat, kill any Christian that you find. And Saul goes around Jerusalem torturing Christians. He's found out that about 120 miles north toward the coast is a little place called Damascus. If I can get there, he thinks... There's a church. There's a lot of believers that get together. They worship freely. 
Still within the confines of Judaism and Israel, he goes to their supreme court and he simply asks them in the Sanhedrin, can I have papers that you allow me to go and show everyone else I'm there to torture Christians? And they gladly sign the documents and Saul starts off on his way. I get this. He's a good Jew. I mean, he could come from up in Tarsus, but he was circumcised at the right time on the right day. He's named Saul for a good reason. His family's from the tribe of Benjamin, 12 tribes in Israel. Tribe of Benjamin, your most famous dude ever, first king of Israel, Saul. That's a heck of a name to give your firstborn boy. Saul Jr., get him. He's highly trained. He's highly skilled. And somewhere on his journey, there's a blinding light that shows up. He drops to the ground, and simply that voice, Saul. Too many scary. I'm going to do it again, all right? Hold on. Saul. Saul, why are you persecuting me? That's, that's always my Jesus voice. That's good. It's always played by James Earl Jones. Simba. That's it. And Saul has no answer. I'm, I'm, I'm killing Christians because they're making a mockery out of the Old Testament God. I'm killing Christians because they claim that you are the Messiah, but we killed you. And now you're, I just, and Saul has no answer. 20 to 30 years of education, 20 to 30 years of some of the best training from Tarsus, some of the best university scholastic that you can get in Judaism. And how could everything he knows and every truth that he holds so dear, so much that he will fight for it, has just been ripped out of his hands and turned upside down. And he meets Jesus as a blinding light on the road. His companions hear the voice, they don't see anything. When they go to pick Saul up, he's blind and he can't see. They lead him to Damascus. And there's a leader in Damascus of the church that he was going to kill called Ananias. And in a dream, God tells him, Ananias, I got a job for you. And Ananias is like, yeah. You know, Saul's coming to town. I know. We put extra locks on the doors. We're praying. We canceled church for the next couple of weeks. We're all in a little bit of hiding. We got plenty of food, provision. We got water. Yeah, I want you to go meet him. Meet him. I blinded him. Yes, good job. We can kill him. He goes, I want you to go pray for him. For a quick death, slow death. I met your terrorist. He's on Straight Street. Ananias has to get up and walk down. I can't imagine how long he paced in front of the house in Straight Street. Seriously? How many friends and family members back in Jerusalem, how many stories have you heard about this guy? What would you do if the guy that was going around North County killing Christians showed up a couple blocks away and you found out he was blind? He goes and knocks on the house. The door's open only a few inches. Yeah, I'm here to see Saul. There's no Saul here and the door's shut. Yeah, God told me Saul's here. I think he also told Saul, you should go ask him. Door shut. <laughs> For three days, Saul hasn't eaten or drank anything. He's laying on a cot, his face to the wall. His entire life, his training, everything has just been thrown upside down. And someone comes in. Um, Mr. Terrace, sorry to bother you. There's an old grizzly dude at the door that said he's supposed to come touch you. And you said in a dream that he, and he's like, yes, let him in. And Ananias comes in and lays hands on him and prays for him and his eyes are open and he invites him to Bible study. He invites him to the Bible study that Saul came to kill. What kind of reception happens there? What kind of church would welcome people that don't look like them, don't speak like them, don't believe like them and have a lifestyle contrary to what you hold dear? God's church welcomes the terrorist. And Saul is sitting there and he can't believe for the first time in his life. He's just met community and grace. Oh, the story starts flying. 30 years are about to happen in 20 pages right now. 
He's going to go out to Arabia somewhere down here. We don't know where. He's going to spend time with Jesus. That's right. Three years, he's going to go. He's going to be taught by Jesus himself. I can't explain it. There's one little verse in Galatians that Paul says, this is what happened to me in a three-year period. He's going to come back, but where does he go? He goes to Jerusalem. To whose house? Peter's house. And he hangs out with Peter and James for 15 days. Would you like to sit on that couch? (laughs) Peter and James, the Peter and James, of all the Peter, James, and John stories, the disciples hanging out with the guy in the church they started that spent two years trying to kill them, and now he's having dinner. For 15 days they hang out, and Saul shows up, door opens, they probably slam it. He's like, I'm expecting that. Can you just hear me out? I met your Jesus. We've been hanging out. And for 15 days. But he can't hang out in Jerusalem because the religious leaders hate him because he's just flipped on them. The Christians don't trust him. So where does he go? A man named Barnabas comes out, an encourager, and says, I got a church for you. It's up to a place called Antioch. Antioch is going to be, that's why we have extra markers. Antioch is going to be up here. It's outside of the Judean territory. It's out on the coast. And Paul hangs out, and he's just as part of an amazing church. And in a Bible study one night, while they're praying, God says, you know what, praying? While they're praying it up. (laughs) While they're praying it up, God says, it's time to go. Barnabas, I want you and Saul, otherwise known as Paul. The name change didn't happen because of the blinding light. Sometimes it's interchangeably. It's both the Greek and the Hebrew name that's happening. Or, anyways, so Saul, otherwise is Paul. I'm going to use them both now. Now they take off on a journey. They come across to Seleucia, over to Salmis. They're on the island of Cyprus. They walk across and they start telling everybody, have you heard the stories from this place? And everyone's like, are you kidding us? Everyone's heard stories. Let us set you straight on who he is and what he did and why. Some people believe. Some people just entertained by the stories. They get all the way to Paphos. There's a governor's house over there. The governor has been told, on your island, two guys are putting all the Jesus pieces together in the puzzle. You ought to hear him. He brings them up to the mansion. He's got his own sorcerer, his own little power dude. And every time Paul and Barnabas try to tell a story, the sorcerer's button in. So finally, Paul goes, look, just shut up. And the sorcerer becomes blind. People have to lead him out. He looks at the governor and realizes, I just blinded the governor's sorcerer. And he goes, look, I'm sorry. The guy was just annoying me. And the governor's like, hey, I'm not going to annoy you. Why don't you stay for dinner? (laughs) They stay for dinner. They have an incredible conversation. And the governor becomes Christian. And so now he wants Christianity to be the religion of Cyprus. They sail over here to Perga. They land and they can come up through these places of Antioch and Pisidia. Antioch is the same Antioch here. Yes, I know. It's the same name. It's like Springfield. They're all over the place. And they start hanging out here in the city. As they start traveling through Pisidia and Iconium, they're going to go into the synagogue. This is what Paul and Barnabas are going to do. Barnabas has a cousin named Mark, and they take him with. These three guys are going to find a synagogue on the day of worship, and they're going to sit there. And in every synagogue, there's a place where someone can get up and read from the scrolls and teach, a place in the service that's just open for the body to speak into. And every time, Paul will stand up. He'll grab one of the scrolls. He'll talk about the Messiah, and he'll tell them about Jesus. Now, this doesn't go well most of the time. Can you imagine someone coming to North Coast, pushing Larry out of the way during one of the messages and saying, hey, you guys are dead wrong on everything you believe. And you're like, ah, gone. I mean, you got the right basis, but you miss the Messiah. You miss Jesus. These stories that you've been hearing about, everything that happened in the city for three years, That was your Messiah. He didn't come to set up a kingdom. He didn't come to kick Roman butt. It was a spiritual thing. He came for eternities, not to give you a better 60 years here. He cares about you way more than just your 60 years here. Some buy into it. Some don't. They get kicked out of town. They go to the next town. I got to have my little note sheet here as we start walking through. Oh, where'd I leave off? In Pisidia, there's an angry mob that chases them out right here. They're going to come up to Antioch and Iconium. As they come over here to Iconium, same thing. They go to the synagogue, they start preaching. Half the crowd likes them, half don't. In Iconium, there's a group outside the synagogue that says, look, when they come outside, if we can catch them sometime tonight, let's pick up rocks and kill them. Well, one of the believers tells Paul, hey, it was a good sermon. A lot of people liked it. Others are going to kill you. It's a tough comment card right there. So Paul looks at Barnabas, and they're like, yeah, where's 
we're new on this trip. Let's just go to the next town. So they come to the next town, and the next town is Lystra. You have a map on back if you want to follow, or just watch this later. I don't know. It's just a story. I don't know where it's going either. And so they're at Lystra right here. At Lystra, they start walking through the street teaching, and there's a crippled man, and they look down, and Paul says, look, I just stand to your feet and walk, and he walks, and the town's like, holy cow, we've heard stories from several years ago about a Jesus that could do that, but now you can do it? He's like, well, it's the power of Jesus, not us, and they start doing a parade, and everyone starts rushing out the city with Paul and Barnabas, and they want to make sacrifices, and they're teaching and speaking in the Laconian language, and Paul and Barnabas are like, what's going on? And their buddies tell them they think you're Zeus and they think you're Hermes. They think you're gods that came to earth. They're running out to the temple of Zeus and they want to give sacrifices on your behalf. So Paul jumps in front of the parade and says, guys, we're just mere men like you. I've just met a risen God, but there's nothing different between us. Just then, the guys with rocks in their hand from Iconian show up and go, um, they're right. They're just troublemakers. They busted up the last two towns and they all hit them with stones. <laughs> and they drag Paul outside the city and they leave him for dead. The Bible doesn't say it's a miracle. But when you stone somebody and leave them for dead, and the next day they get up and they continue doing ministry, it was either an incredibly quick healing <laughs> or raising from the dead. You can decide what happens there. They come back through these other cities. They hit the port and they come back to Antioch and they sit in church and go, guys, remember that Bible study we had a year ago? You wouldn't believe what's happened. <laughs> Let me tell you about how some are receiving and some aren't receiving Jesus in this entire area out here. And they stay in Antioch for about three more years. Well, once again, the group comes together and says, guys, I think there's more to do here. I think people need to know. This time, Barnabas and Paul split up. You see, Barnabas wants to take his cousin slash nephew. I think it's cousin, though. No. Um, John Mark. And Paul's like, I don't like Mark. Halfway through this, he deserted us. And Barnabas is like, well, we're getting hit with rocks a lot. <laughs> it's hard to get people staying on all the way when that's kind of how it's treated. I think we give him another shot. And Paul goes, you give him another shot. He's not traveling with me. He's had his shot. One of the many reasons I read Paul and go, I would never work with him and he would never have me. But he's a heck of a guy. <laughs> and Paul decides to take Silas with him. And they head up and they go through. They come to a city called Derby. Now, this is the second trip. In Derby, there's a Jewish woman married to a Greek man. They have a son named Timothy. He's heard about these teachings from the last time they were in this area. He's become a Christian. And everyone in the church goes, you know, if you're looking for an intern, Timothy's awesome. He'd be our youth pastor, but we don't have youth pastors yet. That's another thousand years. <laughs> you should take Timothy. And Timothy joins Paul and Silas, and they start moving. Some of you at this time are going, isn't this how we got the New Testament? I thought we were doing the New Testament books. All of this, at the end, we'll put all 27 New Testament books in a place where you go, wow. If you've seen it before, you're just sitting there going, I know it's coming. If you haven't, you're going to sit there and go, wow. That's our New Testament? I never knew it was one 30-year story. And where they came from. From Derby, they get Timothy. They come back through the cities and they come up this way. Paul doesn't know what to do. They think they're supposed to go to Bithynia, but they're stopped. They think they're supposed to go north, but they're stopped. He's confused. I love that the Bible says, on one of the greatest missions of God ever, it's okay to be confused. So Paul simply says, we went to Troas and we stayed there, which is brilliant. It's a beach community. It's an all-inclusive resort, hammocks, umbrella drinks. <laughs> When you've been kicked out of town, mob scene, rioted, stoned, you just need siesta. And they're hanging by the beach. Aren't you supposed to be on a missionary trip? We have no clue what to do. We're not told how God stopped him. We're just told. He got up here and he tried to go different directions and the Spirit of God said no. So they're hanging out in Troas in a little beach community. And they have to see a doctor, probably because of all the bones that have been broken and the bumps on their head. And they meet a doctor named Luke. And Luke's like, what have you guys been through? And they're like, let me tell you the story. It started with the blinding light. But I got 20-20 now. Just wait. This is going to take a while. Luke closes up his pharmacy and his doctor's office and he joins them. And from this moment on in the book of Acts, everything is with personal pronouns. I, we, and us, and our. Not only do they have a physician to help them out because this is going to be a rough trip. But they have an incredibly educated guy who's really good at doing notes even though you can't read them. 
<laughs> Doctor? No, anyone. <laughs> and he'll start putting it all together. And in a dream one night, Paul has a vision he's supposed to go to Philippi. They never dreamt of coming over here. They thought this was about here. And so they crossed the northern part of this is called the Aegean Sea. And they land at Philippi. It's the first time now they're going to set foot within the Roman soil. And they're going to go and look for a synagogue. But there is no synagogue in Philippi. Which means there's not enough Jewish people to even have a worship place. Either there's Jews there that have given up on Judaism or there's just not many Jews in the town of Philippi. So they go down to the river and the water. Once again, I like this guy. And they look for people and they begin to teach. And there's a woman there named Lydia. The Bible simply said she's a dealer in purple. Stop. It's a little bit of a Google search. First century purple dye. Never ever read one or two things you find on Google. Get at least six or eight to find out is there any truth in this. Otherwise, purple dye came from aliens a long time ago. <laughs> in the Aegean Sea, on the eastern side of the Mediterranean, there's little sea snails. And these sea snails emit a tiny little drop of purple dye for two reasons. Number one, when they lay their eggs, they cover it with this purple mucus. It's to ward off anything else that would try to eat the eggs. And secondly, it's a defense mechanism. When scared enough, they can get a little bit of purple out. If she is a dealer in purple linen, she is incredibly wealthy. The amount of people it takes to gather the tens of thousands of snails, the amount of man hours, the production that has to happen to get enough dye to make anything purple is ridiculous. And if you buy and sell in that industry, you've got hundreds if not thousands of employees and contacts helping you out. There's two ways to do it. You either crush the snail and get the purple out, or you milk a snail. <laughs> it's true. I don't know how you milk a snail, but you can, or maybe just scare it. Ah! And you're, there's one. No synagogue, but a dealer in purple. Lydia becomes the first convert right here. Paul and uh, Timothy and Silas start walking through town. There's a slave girl that people have made profit on, not sexually. The Bible says she has a spirit and she can tell futures. And there's men that own this girl. And they will tell her who to work for and who not to work for. And the highest bidder can get your futures. And they make a good deal of money off of her. And as Paul and Silas and Timothy are going through town telling people about Jesus, the spirit and the slave girl start speaking. They're telling you about Jesus, the son of God, and how to be saved. And they're like, we don't need you on this. We're good. And they start to have a Bible study in the street, and the slave girl starts screaming out, they're going to tell you about Jesus, the Son of God, and how to be saved. And Paul's like, that's enough. Spirit, come out of her. And she shrieks, and the demon leaves her. I don't know about you, but I would have kept her going. If the town knows she's got a spirit, it's like, yeah, speak up. She's got it. But truth coming from the wrong vessel is the wrong ministry. And maybe Paul has learned from Jesus He's concerned more about the reputation of a girl than his. And once the owners of the girl sees that the demon has left her, they realize now they're broke. So they go to the leaders of the town, and they say there's some men in here that are stirring up trouble. They grab them. They bring them to jail, at least Paul and Silas. I don't know how Timothy got out of this. He's like, stop, breakfast burrito. Next thing he knows, they're being arrested. And he's like, I'll just hang back. <laughs> Paul and Silas are taken to prison. They're beaten. They're whipped. And that night, they start worshiping God, probably because on the stone slab, they can't lay down. There's no part of their body that isn't bleeding. And they're just worshiping. And in the middle of night in Philippi, there's an earthquake. And the jail doors open. And when the earth stops rumbling, the jailer runs down and looks thinking the prisoners have escaped, and now he, in turn, has to take all their punishment and sentence. He's about to kill himself. And Paul speaks up and says, hey, we're still here. He's like, why are you guys here? Maybe for you. And they tell him about Jesus. And the jailer takes him home in Philippi, wakes up his family, makes his wife cook a meal, and around candlelight they tell the stories, the ripple effect of a man that walked on water 
and who he was. And way out here, our first converts in the Roman Empire, Lydia and a jailer and his family all become Christians. And that morning, before 8 a.m., there's an awkward conversation across the breakfast table. Would you guys mind going back to jail with me today? <laughs> They'll be by at 8 to check on cells. And if you're not there, well, Paul and Silas walk back to jail. The magistrate of Philippi sends words down. We beat the guys, kick them out of town. The jailer comes. Hey, good news. They said they beat you enough. Get out of town. And Paul says, I'm not leaving. I want an apology and an escort. <laughs> hey, you probably shouldn't push it at this point. I'm a Roman citizen. <laughs> you don't beat, you don't touch a Roman citizen without Rome approval in the trial. It's a death sentence. I promise you, everyone working that jail that day got really quiet. You're not messing around, are you? No, I'm a Roman citizen. And you didn't tell us? <laughs> no one asked. If you got a get out of jail free card, you play it before you go to jail. If you have a no one can touch me card, you play it before you're beaten. Why'd you guys go through that? Maybe for him and his wife and the three kids at home. Maybe their salvation was worth more than our bruises and our blood. At any rate, I want an apology and an escort. When the magistrate of Philippi realizes they beat a Roman citizen, he comes down to the jail himself. He checks out the paperwork. He's got an apology. You guys hungry? Can we do anything for you? Continental breakfast? You've eaten? All right. Are we good? Can I just walk you out? Are we fine? Is this going to come back? Am I dead? What's going on? And they take them outside the city of Philippi. They come over here to Thessalonia. Thess <laughs> Thessalonia. They come over here to Thessalonia. And across the Thessalonia, they only stay there for what we know is three Sabbaths, maybe longer, but they're only three times in the synagogue. Once again, the people hate him. Once again, they come to the house to kill him. They can't find Paul, so they take, um, they take the owner of the house where he's staying, and they take him prisoner, and they make him put up bonds to make sure that they get, John, they get Paul and Silas back. So Jason, the owner of the house, is held captive. From there then... They sneak out Paul and Silas and Timothy. They go to Berea where, Berea, where people examine everything they say with scriptures themselves. Wait, you're saying this? Where is that found? Isaiah 40. Did anybody have a Bible? Check it and see what they're true. Wait, now you're quoting Psalms. What Psalm is that? Check the Bible. Make sure it's true. They're not people that stand in church and just go, well, Chris said it. Larry said it. Hilkin said it. It must be true. They're people that have the word of God and they check. Is this true or is this not? From there, they make their way around the horn to a place called Athens. Athens has a hill devoted to all the gods, and they have one God to an unknown God. And Paul stands, and he gives a speech in front of the unknown God. Let me tell you about the one you left out, and it is the most important God. It's an amazing speech, but very few people believed. So they make their way to Corinth. Corinth is a giant port city. See, this little inlet of water didn't take a whole lot of digging before you could get water flowing all the way through. Cargo can easily be taken off and loaded on another ship. Smaller ships can be wheeled or floated through this area. And Corinth has become a hub. It's the entire capital of Achaia. And Paul once again shows up at the Jewish church. And once again, the Jews don't treat him finally. And he goes, you know, why am I doing this? And he starts hanging out with Gentiles. And Paul is going to spend time in Corinth at this for one and a half years, and he's going to build a church. Corinth is a place of open sexuality. You order it like you do your happy meals. You can get a number five, six, or number eight supersized if you want. It is a place where anything goes. It is a Las Vegas waterway. It is a port far from Rome, but right in the center of the rest of the world activity. It is a place where merchants, military, businessmen and women hang out far from home. And there's a group of people that are tired. I'm tired of my sexuality. I'm tired of my porn. I'm tired of my addictions. I'm tired of my drugs. I'm tired of my alcohol. I have consumed everything, Corinth, and I am empty. And there's a lecture hall in the center of town, four blocks off Main Street where a man speaks truth that you can't get enough of. It's about grace and mercy, not who you were and what you've done. <laughs> right, buddy, because you don't know who I am 
and what I've done. Listen to me. Um, the Bible study is led by the terrorists that killed Christians. Dang. That dude may have outdone me. He knows something about grace and mercy. And in a year and a half, little Corinth starts to explode. When the weather's back for sailing, they leave here. They come to another port city, Ephesus. Paul spends some time. The people beg him to stay, but he has to leave. He comes back to Antioch, and the second journey is done. After some time in Antioch, there's a third journey. He's going to travel up here to all these cities. It's an area called Galatia again. He's going to go back to Ephesus. He's going to spend two years in Ephesus. He'll make his way back around the horn from Corinth. He'll return to Jerusalem to bring an offering. There's many believers in Jerusalem. And if he stuck to the Christian church, he would have done well. But he goes to the temple. And the people in the temple hate him. You're the terrorist that years ago turned on us. They saw him in town with Gentile followers. And so now the rumor gets out. He has brought Gentiles, non-Jews, into our temple. You cannot do that. So they string him up as a crime. They take him up to the leadership. They have Rome arrest this guy for causing a riot. And Rome keeps him overnight. Jewish believers in Judaism, not Christianity, gather outside. And they take an oath. We will not eat until we kill Paul. And they went to their church and told them, the temple, we're so dedicated to the Old Testament, to defending God, the one true God, that this Messiah stuff has to stop. A Messiah would have freed us. A Messiah would have made this life better. A Messiah would have set up a free Jerusalem. A Messiah would have kicked Rome out. A Messiah would have built a capital. A Messiah would have given us political freedom. And we're tired of some carpenter story. We won't eat until we kill Paul. As that word is getting around the temple, Paul's nephew hears it, the son of his sister. He comes running to the guards, asks to speak with his uncle, tells Paul the story. Paul said, you better tell the guy in charge. And they tell the guy in charge. And now he's got a crisis on his hands. Dang, now that I know this, if I let a Roman citizen, even though he's a Jew, free, and he's killed on my hands. Uh, so in nightfall, with horseback and armor and weapons, they take him to Caesarea, a coastal city. And for two years, he's imprisoned. He'll meet almost every magistrate, every ruler of the area in the Roman Empire. They love hearing his stories. They're not sure what to do with him. You've done nothing wrong. Rome doesn't care about you. We'll let you go. As soon as you let me go, I'm going to be killed. Well, then we can't let you go. We want to let you. What? He goes, I appeal to Caesar. Okay. And after two years, they put him on a boat. It's a long trip across. It's crazy. There's a shipwreck out here on the island of Crete. They finally make it up here. They get to, no, they get around Crete. There's a shipwreck on Malta. He finally gets to Rome, and he'll spend two years under house arrest in Rome. He'll be released for a couple years. He won't stop talking about a Jesus. And there is a God other than Caesar. So finally they'll bring him back. They'll arrest him, and they'll cut off his head. To this point, this is a story of Jesus and Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Peter and James and John. After a 10-minute break, every New Testament book you have, all 27, is just going to fall in the slots. It'll still be a story. Who he wrote to and why. And my hope is you never see that book the same again. The most boring, ancient, non-applicable book in the world that was preached to me on weekends. And I never had a clue that these 30 years we just covered has the entire New Testament in it and what it was for and why. If you need to leave, leave, by all means. If there's like just two rows left, we'll gather up front. <laughs> and I want you to see that book like you've never seen it before. You may even know what's in it. Some of your favorite verses and stories. But who wrote it and when and why and what city that landed in. 
makes everything written in those pages come to life. <laughs> I had uh, some people come up and say, uh, hey, some of that I've heard you do before. And I'm like, yeah, it's, um, it's the same Bible. Uh, <laughs> I've been teaching here now for uh, over 14 years, and uh, it'd be nice just to make up new stuff all the time and get fresh material, but it's, it's the same book. <laughs> now we're going to put it all together. We're coming in still? This is good. Wow, most of you came back. I lost that bet big time. <laughs> big time. So now, when you walk into church on the weekends, you carry this book. Old Testament, New Testament, New Testament, 27 books. And you've already heard the story of every single one of them. You just got it. All 27 books you have now heard and seen. All we're going to do for the rest of this, and it shouldn't take us an hour by any means, is just go back and put the pieces together. Let's start with number one. He's a tax collector in Jerusalem. He knows he's hated, but he traded that for wealth. It's nothing like our system. It's not that, well, you have to pay taxes, the percentage of your income. No, 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 no. Remember, Rome now owns you, your people, your land, your servants to Rome. Rome collects taxes. Rome is smart enough to know we're not going to send our guys out from Rome all over the known world to collect taxes. No one's going to like that. They're going to be beaten down. We're going to demand taxes be collected from your city by your people. And here's how we're going to do it. We will allow you to bid on taxes for this next year. And so it was an amazing system Rome set up. For the entire quadrant of Jerusalem and the surrounding hills and the Shephelah all the way down to the eastern Mediterranean. Next Thursday, 2 p.m., if you're interested in collecting the taxes for that, you show up and it's a bidding war. Where do our taxes start this year? And someone says, I'll collect $50,000. And someone goes, I'll collect $60,000, $70,000, $80,000. And you outbid yourself. Now, you got to be shrewd because if you can't come up with the taxes that you bid on, your head is on the line. But you're allowed to keep a percentage of that. And so everyone understands that. You have outbid, you have jacked my taxes up over and over and over again just to pad your pockets. And when the tax man comes, you can't say no because the power of the Roman government is behind him. So they're Jewish people who collect taxes from Jewish people, but they've sold out their own people. They've ripped them off in order to live a life of luxury. And Levi is one such guy. And somewhere in his brokenness of materialism and wealth, Jesus walks by the booth. There's conversation. There's story. And he leaves shop, much like Luke did up in Troas. I have all that money can buy. And there's no price on what I really want. And I'm following you. Your New Testament starts with his book. He's called Matthew. He's also called Levi. And he writes a book. He's now a Jew writing to Jewish people. He's writing from this Jerusalem area. Your first book in the New Testament, Matthew, this tax collector simply wants to write, I want to tell you what I did with Jesus for three years. I want to tell you as one of his disciples what it was like. I want to tell you primarily that he is king of the Jews. This guy was the one we were waiting for. Because he's a Jew and because he's writing to Jews, he's going to use more Old Testament quotes than anybody else. He's going to use more prophecy than anyone else. He wants to start his entire book with the lineage going all the way back and all the way through David just to show that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of the Jews. And the very first book in your Bible is simply called Matthew. Your second book is called Mark. Mark lived in Jerusalem. His mother Mary had a house there. I've got a theory. I think it's supported by the Bible, even though I can't say it for sure, but I think I'm right. And in heaven, I'm just going to say I told you so. I think Mark's house had an upper room where the Last Supper was held. 
Here's why. Mark is going to write a book. He's going to write a book to the Christian world. He was young when Jesus was around Jerusalem, but he became the traveling companion of Peter. Yes, this is the same Mark, by the way, that went on missionary journeys and got kicked out. This is the same Mark that is the cousin of encourager Barnabas, and they had the dispute, and Paul said, look, when the rock started getting thrown, he left us. He's no good for anything. And God said, he's good enough to write Bible. I think you missed that one, Paul. (laughs) And every Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, four books that talk about the life of Jesus, talk about that last night, talk about the death, talk about the crucifixion, talk about going out into the garden, talking about going out with the 12. Jesus knew it was going to happen. If they came to pick Jesus up in the city, a riot of epic proportions would have busted out. He took his disciples outside the city. He went to the garden. No one has to go down but him. And only in the book of Mark, it says this. As the disciples ran, there was a young man watching. The Roman guards tried to grab him. He ducked out of his nightclothes, and he ran away naked. Did you ever see that in a film strip? Was that ever in a Sunday school? Did you ever get to color the naked kid? The night of the crucifixion? No one ever told me that story. It's a little verse only in the book of Mark. And you read that and go, what the heck was that about? You go to Matthew, he talks about Jesus, the garden, the disciples, doesn't talk about a naked kid running away. You go to Luke, he talks about the crucifixion, doesn't know. You go to John, he talks about that night, doesn't talk about a little naked kid running away. Mark puts it in, why? Here's what I think. His house is where the church used to meet. His house is where the upper room was. The guards came that night and probably woke up the entire family. They want to know where Jesus and the disciples was. Judas had sold them out. Judas had left the upper room to go say, now's your time. We can get him. And when they came back, Jesus had taken the disciples outside the city. I bet they woke up a young kid down below named Mark who had a passion and love for Jesus and the disciples. Maybe at the age of 11 or 12, he sat with wide-eyed wonder at who these men were and what they were doing in his house. And my bet is, with just his little night gone on, he ran as fast as he could to get to the garden. And by the time he got there, there were guards and there were disciples. And Peter was getting an ear cut off and disciples ran. And making commotion, trying to get back home, they tried to grab him. And being a little squirrely guy, he just ducked out of his gown and ran home, which is nothing but his underoos on. (laughs) I think it's Mark's way of putting in the text, I was there without saying I was there. His name is John Mark. He's the cousin of Barnabas. He writes the second book. We have Matthew and we have Mark. He writes from Rome to Rome later on in life. He's in Rome with Peter 30 years after all this has happened. And he writes a book to the Roman world. He doesn't concern himself a whole lot with Old Testament, with prophecies. He knows all the people up in this area don't really care about Judaism and what was happening in the Old Testament. He's just trying to get out to everybody. This is Savior And this is Lord. He's the shortest of the four books of Jesus. That's why it's my favorite. (laughs) Remember I told you here they picked up a guy named Luke? Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke is the third book. He's going to write an orderly account. He's going to make his way. Not only is he going to write everything that I just said. Some of you came up here and said, where'd you get that story from? We're about to get to it. Luke's going to come back here and make eyewitness accounts. Every leper, every blind man, every crowd, every synagogue ruler, everybody he could find, tell me this story. Uh Uh-huh, mm-hmm, spit a loogie, put it on your eyes. Uh Uh-huh, how many fingers am I holding up? Dang, you're good, got it, next. And Luke's going to use his education, his doctor of mine, and he's going to put together the most thorough account he has. He's going to be the Gentile author, the non-Jewish guy that gets to write the story of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called synoptics. It's a big word. just means simply sharing the same or having the same view. Because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first three books in your Bible, all concern themselves with Jesus. They share most of the same miracles, most of the same teaching, and it's all right here. Oh, there's discrepancies. Well, in Mark it said one blind guy came. In Luke it said two blind guys came. Psh, can't trust the Bible. And I'm like, Seriously? Seriously? 2,000 years ago, these stories happened? The Bible's written by 40 different authors over hundreds of years apart? And what you call them on is one blind guy versus two? Seriously, that's the discrepancy you find in the Bible? Well, if that's the discrepancy you find in life, throw everything away. Mark didn't say there's only one. He just talked about one. Luke saw it from eyewitnesses. I also step back and read the book of John that says so much of what he did we didn't record. I look at it and go, 
How do we know he didn't heal 40 or 50 blind men at different times? In ones, twos, and threes, how do we know they're even the same stories? They're just writing about the miracles. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptic, gospels, good news, the stories of Jesus. Your fourth book is John. John is the only one of the disciples that wasn't martyred. John is the only one of the 12 that is allowed to die of old age. He will spend a couple years in Ephesus in this church right here. He will become a main figure for the church of Ephesus. Then they're going to exile him out to the island. And that's where he's going to spend his time. He's not going to be around the public anymore, but they won't kill him. Early church tradition says they tried to boil him alive, so he was an incredibly disfigured guy in his older age. And John's going to write a book. It's different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's going to write it some 30 to 40 years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's as if he's saying, look, you already have Matthew, Mark, and Luke stories. They're awesome. I was there. I saw it. He's the last of the Mohicans. He's dying of old age. He realizes there's so many stories. And John's going to take a different approach. Very few miracles. No parables in the book of John. John is just trying to write to everybody why he was the son of God. Luke's going to write more doctoral and medical stuff in his book. John doesn't care about the main action, the stories. He's got a theology of just getting out the last book you need to know about Jesus. You've heard the stories, the teaching, the miracles. Matthew, Mark, Luke, incredible. Let me tell you why he was the son of God. And let me tell you why you can bank on that. And let me tell you why you can base your death and your eternity on that. The very next book is called Acts in your Bible. A-C-T-S, Acts. It's the actions of all that happened. Everything I told you in the first hour on this board comes from the book of Acts. Read it yourself. It takes about 45 minutes to read the book of Acts. 30 years after Jesus was crucified and risen again, all of this happens. And the doctor was on the journey. And the doctor write it down. He goes, let me tell you, from Philippi, from Troas on, let me tell you this is what we did. This is what we did. This is what we did. This is what I saw. This was our trip. This was our mission. This is what we did. And it is an eyewitness account of the actions, of the ripple effect of this life of Jesus down here in Jerusalem. 30 years we covered. Therefore... Luke is going to write more of the New Testament than anyone else in just two books, Luke and Acts, by volume, by word count, more than any other author. And he's going to start and just say, I'm giving you a thorough eyewitness account of everything I saw, of everything we did. And the part I have to go back to on the life of Jesus, I'm going to give you a thorough eyewitness account of what I've investigated and what I've heard for myself. Matthew, Mark, Luke, the later book of Jesus, John, four books of Jesus, now the acts of what happened. From here on out, all on these journeys, all in these spots, all as Paul was planning these churches and leaving little groups of Bible studies and believers, he had to stay in touch. He would hear back reports. Here's what's going on in Colossae. Here's what's going on in Philippi. Here's what's going on in Ephesus. So he would sit down when given the time, when they weren't being chased about or being stoned to death, when he had time for like three months in corn, he would sit and write letters to places. Some of these churches he started eight years earlier and he hasn't been able to get back to. I just want you to write a letter about what's going on. Two big ones, First and Second Corinthians, we come to next. Remember I talked about Corinth, the Las Vegas on the waterway? It needs some letters written to it. They've got some serious problems. So Paul has to write, you shouldn't sleep with your stepmom. I mean, you shouldn't have to say it, but it's there. By the way, don't get drunk doing communion. That's not good either. Man, these people are new on all this stuff. Let me tell you about idol worship. We got to clear that up. Let me tell you about false teachings. We have to clear that up. Let me talk to you a lot about sexual immorality. We're going to hear a lot about sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians. Why? Because there's a name for someone who is sexually immoral in the first century in Rome. It was called a Corinthian. A Corinthian. Your town is the name for sexually immoral people. (laughs) How would you like that? Really? Really? People go, oh, you're acting like a San Marcos person. And you're like, dang. (laughs) Have we gotten that bad? And it's not in North County. Like people in Philadelphia are like, where are you from, San Marcos? I mean, within a period of decades, the Roman Empire is using a Corinthian, a Corinthian 
as a sexually loose person. So you got a church, they love Jesus, and they don't know a lot, so they're loving a lot of other things as well. And so Paul has to write some letters saying, let me tell you, because of the grace of God and what he did, let me tell you how you give your body back. Let me tell you how your body's going to be a temple. Let me tell you about how you're going to honor God. Not what you're doing to please him, not what you do to work up for him, but in light of what he did and what he saved you from. Let me tell you, because of now you know God's love for you, what your response should be. We have 1 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, he has to write another letter back because people are accusing him that he was only in it for money and he was stirring himself and he was a false teacher. So Paul has to defend himself in 2 Corinthians and he has to write about don't listen to false teachers. Here's what the true gospel is and here's the truth that you have to hold on to. The next letter we have is Galatians. Galatians isn't to a city, it's to a region. Galatia. Galatia is in a city it's a region. Remember I told you all those first little churches he hit where they had riots and mobs and people tried to make sacrifices to Zeus and then he healed a crippled man and then all these people here stoned him and left him for dead and then they picked up. This whole area is called Galatia. So Paul doesn't write a letter to a church because they're all linked together, about eight of them in here. He just writes Galatians. Because they're closer in proximity to Jerusalem than the rest of the Roman Empire. There's more Jews here. Remember, he spent more time in the synagogues here. He didn't really make a flip the switch to really reach non-Jews until he was out here in Corinthians. Because they're Jews, they've got an issue. I love God. I love the grace of God. But the longer Paul is gone, they slip back into legalism. They're slipping back into the Old Testament. They're slipping back into everything Jesus came and died for and says it is finished. It is done. I've completed it. And they slip back into legalism. So Paul writes the book called Galatians to this group of people and says, you have freedom in Christ. By the way, your freedom isn't an excuse for bad behavior. Why are you committing adultery? Freedom in Christ. You haven't been sober in three days. Freedom in Christ. He's like, let me tell you, your freedom in Christ should be used to serve. And to free others. And in a nutshell, this is the book of Galatians. Next we have in the Bible what's called prison epistles. For the two years that he is here and from Rome, the two years in house arrest, he is going to write Ephesus. Remember I told you he stayed there for over two years? He's got a great love affair with the city of Ephesus. There's incredible work happening in the city of Ephesus. If Corinth has the corner of the market on sexuality in this day and age, Ephesus has the corner of the market on black magic, the dark arts. Ephesus is where you go to buy your abracadabras. Ephesus is where you go to buy your incantations. Ephesus is where you go to buy your curses for your enemies and your blessings for you and your family. You wear the blessings close to your chest, under your garment. You buy the scrolls of curses and you bury them in your enemy's field. And you hope he doesn't find them and bury them in yours. Ephesus is the home of the goddess of Diana or Artemis by its Greek or Roman name, the goddess of fertility, the goddess of many breasts. It is one of the major wonders of the world at that time, the size and scope of this palace. It is room after room after room, corridor after corridor after corridor of room after room after room. You worship, you sacrifice, and you indulge in anything sexual with the temple prostitutes. It's hard to compete with the church down the street when that's the church down the street. But Paul's church in two years has made such a dent in the idol business and the black market in Ephesus that they call a business meeting in the town hall and everyone comes together and says, have you noticed no one's buying the shrines anymore? No one's buying the idols anymore? And a riot breaks out of epic proportions. They try to kill Paul and the Christian leaders there. So from prison, he will write a letter to the church that he spent two years planting and doing in Ephesus. He's going to talk about what you need to put on and put off. You put off the old self, and here's what you put on in Christ. You have to put off the old behavior, and here's what you put on in Christ. You put off the old. You put on the new. You're a new creation. Stop going back to the old Ephesians. Stop going back to the old way of life. He's going to talk about the armor of God. Some of you may have heard that. Here's how you put on the armor of God. Here's the helmet of salvation. Here's the breastplate of righteousness. Here's what you wear as a Christian. And he's going to write Ephesians 5. I need you guys to sit down and just be quiet on this one. 
in marriage, I needed to submit to each other. I want to make sure you hear each other first because you're not going to like what comes next, both of you. Wives, I needed to submit to your husband as to the Lord. Notice I added that quickly. Not because he deserves it, not because he's earned it, not because you love him or like him anymore. Because you are a Christian, you're going to submit and you're going to love your husband. Husbands, I need you to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Notice I told you how. As the one who gave himself up for his bride, I need you to present her to yourself in your eyes for her hearing and her emotional and her mentality that she is without stain, that she is without wrinkle, that she is without blemish. I don't care how old she is. I don't care how many years she has. I don't care how many kids she has delivered. You present her to yourself as radiant. Radiant. And it sent shockwaves in the Greek and Roman Empire. Women are to be used and to bear male sons. To keep the home clean if you invite anyone over and to feed and clothe you. To sacrificially die for a woman is nonsense. Husbands are not to be respected. They are to be feared. And Paul writes a book from prison and he takes marriage in a Greek and Roman world and he shreds it and says we're done the churches marriages and families will look radically different than anything outside those walls and you're doing it because you're a Christian not because anybody's earned it or deserved it And down the street, there's the temple to Artemis and Diana. And the men have to stop going. We've heard Ephesians 5 before. But have you ever sat in the dark city of Ephesus and heard it for the first time and realized what a game changer this was? And for every woman touched by the gospel in the words of Jesus... He writes, it ends now. She has value. She has worth. She is the daughter of the king. And if you cannot love her, don't expect to have a great relationship with her father. (laughs) That's why I've always challenged men at North Coast, start our prayers, not with dear heavenly father, but dear (laughs) father-in-law. It's a constant reminder if you're on good terms with God by how you're treating his daughter. In Ephesians 5, in that port city where anything goes, split the fabric of marriage once and for all and put it back together God's ways. After Ephesians, there's Philippians, one of the most heartfelt letters that Paul will ever write. He will write again in prison in Rome, waiting a death sentence, and he will write to Philippi. Remember Lydia? Remember little purple snails? Remember a jailer? Remember there's not a synagogue? Remember she must have some wealth? This people, this people, and this place, and a jailer that realized, you guys saved my life. I should have died tonight because the earthquake, you would have split. These people become the most generous givers Paul has. They are constantly constantly giving to him. They're constantly supporting to him. So from prison, he writes the church in Philippi. We call it Philippians. Let me tell you, he says, I don't know if I'm going to live or die. And they're bonus. If they're asking me to choose, they're both such great decisions. I don't know what I would choose. I mean, if I live, I'm going to keep telling people about Jesus. But if I die, I get to see Jesus. And I tell you, this telling people, it's taking a toll on me. Four years now, total of imprisonment is going on between Caesarea and between up in Rome. He goes, let me tell you what has happened, though. Do you know that they have someone with me on how to rest? Someone is chained with me? Do you know how many guards I talk to every day about Jesus? Do you know they have to go home and love their wives differently? Yes. The Roman elite are starting to sacrificially love their wives and their wives only. He goes, I always wanted to do a ministry in Rome. I just didn't know it would be a prison ministry. But in my prison ministry, I'm reaching the palace through the palace guards. By the way, thanks for your support and your generosity. I know God will richly provide for all your needs. Don't we love that verse out of Philippians? 
Well, my God will richly provide for all my needs. That's if you are a generous Philippian type giver. Not a stingy Christian who just wants more or needs more. That was written to sellers of purple that said, what do you need next? What do you need next? What do you need next? And he writes his dear group and the people in Philippi, and it's simply called Philippians. Oh, he leaves them, by the way, with his devotion to Christ and a challenge, don't drift away. And whatever you hear about me, know I'm good. Either decision is great. Hold on tight and don't drift away. The next book is Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all written from prison in Rome. Colossians isn't even on your map. It's here between Ephesians, just below Antioch, right in this area right here. Ironically, it's the only city that Paul never went to. It's Colossae is the name of the city and that where it's called Colossians. As far as we know, Paul never visited. He sends them ward greetings. He sends them brothers and sisters in Christ. It was probably started by his church in Ephesus, people traveling through, brothers, sisters. You know how video venues happen. Bam, Ramona. And he's like, I haven't even gone there. That's two, <laughs> two on Ramona tonight. That's good. That's a, that's a record. Um, it's a warning against false prophets. Against, here's what's happening in this area. Again, we have a lot of Jews in this area that are still finding out about God but holding on to old customs. Since he wasn't able to teach and plant this church with his own stuff, they've got a mixture of Judaism, Christianity, Eastern mysticism, and Greek philosophy. Colossians is all about the counterfeit. You know the counterfeit by knowing what is true. Here's the true gospel. Here's who Jesus is. This incredible, detailed Colossians 1. Let me tell you who Jesus is. He is the very icon of God. When you tap Jesus, he's the app of God. When you hit Jesus, you get all of God. He was the firstborn of all creation, made before all creation, the maker of all creation. It is a prison rant to a church in Colossae saying, don't fall for the counterfeit. Hold on to the truth. I wasn't there to teach you myself, but this book will get you through it. It's an incredibly clear teaching of Jesus. Next in your New Testament, First and Second Thessalonians. Remember they left Philippi and they moved over to here to Thessal- Thessalonia or Thessalonica. And as they're here in Thessalonica is where another riot broke out. They have to get Paul out of there at night. They take his house, the owner of the house he's staying at, Jason. They take him and make him put up bail, which by the way, the Bible doesn't say it, but it probably means Jason was killed. When you post bond, and the guy you're posting bond for, you sneak out of town, well, you don't do that to the Roman government. My bet is a household that allowed Paul to stay there gave their lives to protect the work going on. My brother did his entire PhD on this, 500 and some pages, just on the court hearing of Thessalonica. (laughs) He's so much smarter than me, it's awesome. I know, doesn't take much. Here's the other thing. The first book, 1 Thessalonians, he's concerned that they're drifting away. Comes there and Silas comes back and goes, they're not drifting away, they're holding strong. He talked to him in the first book about end times, about a second coming. Now he's getting questions from him going, man, so Jesus came, is he coming now? Is this the second coming? We're being persecuted. So 2 Thessalonians has a lot of what we call the rapture, the second coming, eschatological um, theology, the last days, the end times, what is happening. You're going to get quite a bit of that in 1 and 2 Thessalonians because that's what they were interested in. In. Next, you have First and Second Timothy. Remember Ephesus, the big, dark, dirty city Paul set up for two years. When he left, he left a pastor there, a kid, an intern that would make a great youth pastor from Derby named Timothy. After doing these trips for a couple years with Paul, Paul said, you're ready, son. And he put him as the pastor of that church in Ephesus, just down the street from the temple of the goddess of sexuality. And 1 Timothy says, don't let anyone look down on your youthfulness. You may not have the long white beard. You may not have the wrinkles under the eyes. You may not look like an elder in Jewish terms. You set an example for everyone in that city by your life, by your speech, by your purity, by your love. And Timothy wants to take the city by storm. He tells them how to pick elders, how to do church, how to run church. First Timothy is a great book. He's going to write a second book called Titus. We'll get to that in a second. Because in your New Testament, first and second Timothy are together for order. Some three to four years later, he writes his second book, Second Timothy, to Ephesus. 
Almost 30 times he begs Timothy, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up, don't give up. You've been doing ministry for about three to four years now and this world is kicking your butt. You're not making a dent. Your church is just below a billboard that says what happens in Ephesus stays in Ephesus. (laughs) And just when you reach one sailor, a hundred more come into port. They're not there for your church. They're there for the temple prostitutes. And Timothy wants to throw in the towel. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, for me personally, not in teaching, but just personally, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Have you forgotten that I told you you're in a battle? And you're surprised that you're getting shot at? Hmm. It's a little kick in the butt to Timothy. Have you forgotten we're at war here? And you want your life just to be easy. I need you to fight like a good soldier. I need you to please your commanding officer. Don't get caught up in the enemy schemes. I need you to run this race like a good athlete. Stop cutting corners, Timothy. I want you to look at the farmers and realize that they don't get any paycheck on the 15th and 30th. They have no idea what all their blood, sweat, toil, all the expense goes in the land. They won't know until the harvest if anything's going to pan out. And I want you to know, buddy, you're in ministry and there's no harvest yet. So stop whining about yourself. And now let me encourage you. You're sitting in your church in Ephesus whining. I'm in chains in Rome. (laughs) Checkmate. (laughs) Let me tell you what's not chained. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not chained. You cannot confine it. You cannot lock it behind doors. You cannot put it in prison. It is loose. It is alive. It is well. It is taking captives and it is setting them free. And for that, I will keep in chains. And for that, I will stay in prison. And for any elect, for anyone that ever comes to know Christ because of my suffering, because of what I'm doing, I'm going to count it worthy. What's your excuse? Keep on with the fight. And he sent the letter, the second one to Timothy in Ephesus. Little did Timothy or Paul know, it's the last letter he will ever write. They will cut off his head shortly after. So his last words are, I will take on any chains and suffering if it means someone comes to know Christ. Wow. Those words carry a little more weight now, don't they? Like I said, in between those two books, he wrote one called Titus. Titus is another leader that he left. Titus is a pastor in the island of Crete. And he's simply writing an encouragement to him. It's a small little book on just how to pick elders, how to run church operations, how to finish the fight, how to stay away from false teaching. There's a weird little book. We're coming down to the very end of the New Testament called Philemon. Philemon is a one-page book. Sometimes I scratch my head and go, why'd that get in there? There is a slave called Anisimus. Onesimus has broken away from the Colossians area, has made his way to Rome, has found out somehow about Paul, got into a Bible study, came to know Christ, and then after Bible study one night, I'm at least imagining this in my head, said, hey, P-Dog, can I talk to you for a second? And they're like, yeah, what's going on? He's like, I'm actually a slave. I'm owned by somebody, and I stole a bunch of my master's stuff before I left. But now I love God. What do you think I should do? And Paul's like, that's a tough one. I don't have a good verse for that. Who is your owner? I wrote down the owner's name because I always forget what it is. It's Onesimus, runaway slave. Oh, it's the name of the book. Sorry, Philemon. The little book at the end, Jude, is the guy I don't know his name. He's all, what's the name of your owner, Philemon? Where is he from? The Colossians Church. And Paul goes, I know that guy. Seriously? You know the owner I ran away from? Now, don't think modern-day slavery and don't think 1800 slavery. Don't think American history, the evil of slavery. Slavery wasn't indentured servants. A lot of people gave themselves to be slaves of wealthy families because they can work the land, they can be taken care of, they can be given housing, food, their family would have a better upbringing. So we got to get slavery out of our head for a second on that. So Paul writes Philemon. He goes, Onesimus, take this letter to Philemon. And Onesimus makes his way back home. And this one-page letter just simply says, "Um, Philemon, you could probably kill your slave, but I found him like a son to me. He's now a brother in Christ. I'm asking you to give grace and love. I can't order you to do that. You have your rights, but man, I know I would. (laughs) And it's a little book that says, if you're wronged, here's how to make it right. And here's how to give grace. And if you've done wrong, maybe it's time to suck it up and go make it right. 
It's a little one-page wonder called Philemon. From Philemon we called Hebrews. We've been spending 30 weeks in Hebrews, kind of enough said here at North Coast. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Now we're getting into other authors. Paul, we're done with his letters. First Timothy, Titus, Second Timothy, he's done. Philemon's thrown in there, but it was written earlier. Hebrews, unknown author to a Jewish audience, just saying, don't go back to legalism. Again, we've been teaching that on Sundays. We did use the time, and now I'm running out. James is next. James is the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He's the half-brother of Jesus. He's writing a letter to the 12 scattered. It's called a universal epistle. In other words, it's not written to any church. It's written to the 12 tribes, Jews, because of the persecution here that have scattered all across. So he writes a letter just saying how to get through persecution. And James has got one of the best five-page books on practical Christian living. Every time he gets deep, he throws a picture or a story in there. And I'm like, I can follow that. I can follow that. It's like a bit in the horse's mouth. It's like looking into a mirror. It's like someone that's got a ship and it's being torn. And I'm like, oh, I like James. It's story time with James. He's writing to Christians that are persecuted. Here's how to handle persecution. And here's how to hold on to your Christian walk and life. Next, we have First and Second Peter. Peter is up here in Rome with Mark. Peter's writing to this area down here that we would call Asia. So all these churches in Galatia and Ephesians and Colossians and beyond. And again, the persecution is starting to wreak havoc from the Roman world on Christians at this time. So he just writes about suffering and how to hang in there and how to hold on to the truth and who your God is. And that's 1 Peter. He then writes about having great relationships with authorities, great relationships with each other. And 2 Peter, he writes a warning against false teaching. You see, once you have the gospel and the freedom of Christ, Ephesus and Corinth... And Jerusalem has a way of coming back in. Oh, I love God. I see what God did. What about my old lifestyle? What about my old magic? What about my old relationships? What about my old self-pleasing? What about my old? And the world keeps coming back in. And it's false teaching that says, you're okay. You're still all right. You got Jesus. You got forgiveness. You got grace. And almost every one of these books are written to Christians in an incredibly pagan society saying, hold on to the truth in the gospel of Jesus. And don't water it down. Next you have 1 and 2 John. Again, John is in Ephesus until he's exiled to the island out to Patmos right here. So he's in this church in Ephesus. His first and second book, he just writes to Christians about the love of God and how to follow God in obedience. If you ever want to know about God's love and how are you supposed to love God, back of the Bible, two little tiny books, 1 and 2 John. Um, They're only a couple pages each, and they just hit you one after another. He's the last of the Mohicans, the only disciple that wasn't killed. He's dying of old age. Now he's dying exiled out on an island to at least try to silence him. And he's writing a book. Here's God's love, and here's how to love God. Third John is the one that I looked at and said, what's the name of the guy? He's writing about a squabble in a church between a guy named Gaius and a guy named Diotrep. They call him Dio. His friends call him Dio. (laughs) One is showing hospitality to Christians coming through. The other guy's not showing hospitality to Christians coming through the town. So he praises Gaius for showing hospitality and being generous. And he kind of slams Dio and says, look, if you're a real Christian, you'd be generous and be hospitable. It's a great little book if you're not hospitable. Right before Revelation, second to last book is called Jude. Jude is written by James's brother, the leader of the church, and Jude is part of the leader in Jerusalem. Wait, if Jude is the brother of James and James is the half-brother of Jesus, then Jude is also the half-brother of, yeah, that's how it worked. These were Jesus's little brother who just grew up going, man, why does he always make good grades? We can't be as good as Jesus. How can <laughs> And then they saw him going out, miracles teaching. They're like, this guy's a wacko. He's our brother. How can he be God? And then they killed him. And he's like, dang, we lost our brother because he just didn't have common sense. And then he rose from the dead. And they're like, dang, we grew up with the Messiah. That's jacked up. That is jacked up. I always said the greatest proof that Jesus was the son of God is that his two brothers are now leading the church and writing books. I've got two brothers that I grew up with in West Texas. What would I have to do to convince them that I'm the son of God? Rise from the dead. That's the most, that's it. To me, the greatest proof Jesus rose from the dead is that his two younger brothers are like, oh, I'm in. Man, man, didn't see that coming. Should have shared more. 
Judah's going to write a book. He just condemns heretics, false teaching, and challenging Christians that are scattered abroad just to hold on to the faith. The very last book in your Bible is called Revelation, or the Revelation to John. It is from this island out here in exile. The same John that walked with Caesar, the same John that walked with Peter, James, and John, the same John that has written two books on love and the last of the four gospels, the good news of Jesus about the ripple effect that he was the son of God is now exiled to die in old age on this island. And Jesus shows up and gives him a revelation. It's almost as if to say, you're the last of my boys. Some didn't make it long at all. I want you to know it's all worth it. And I wanted to show you the end. So John's going to say, I'm going to tell you I was brought to heaven and I'm going to write stuff that's hard to explain. To give every Christian hope that whatever suffering, whatever you're going through, whatever the cancer, whatever the diagnosis, whatever the relationship, whatever the rejection, I just want to give you a scoreboard. (laughs) Scoreboard. We win. The book of Revelation is simply showing Jesus as a lamb of God who shows up on a scene of heaven with blood on the lamb, a lamb that was slain, but now a lamb that will judge and a lamb that will rule over a new heaven and a new earth after evil and all wrong and all harm has been judged and dealt with once and for all. Scoreboard. Bank on it. I knew it. I believed it. Jesus told us all about it. I've now been able to see it. The last book of the Bible is a book of hope. With images and stuff I still don't understand, I can't explain. With apocalyptic writings and words that John, a creator, is shown by the creation heaven, and he can't explain it. He goes, heaven's got like streets of gold. Now, people, I promise you, when you get to heaven, it will not have streets of gold. All John is saying is, you know, you know our streets where all the animals and the camels and the donkeys and the sheep where people threw out all their urine and all their feces because they didn't understand germs, biology, and microbiology back then. That's why foot washing was a big deal. The streets are just layered crap. That's what he's writing. He said, he said I can't explain heaven. It's, 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 their crap is our gold. That's what he's trying to get across. I promise you, earthly material isn't heaven. Heaven's beyond us. He's just trying to give you a glimpse. What is the worst part of your life? In heaven, the worst part of heaven is gold. It's, 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 wow. It's 27 books. Letters to the churches, to the people, to the pastors, from the pastors, to their people. Because something happened in this city some 2,000 years ago. And today, you cannot go a week without this tiny sliver of land showing up in our news. There is a dome that is fought over on a mount that used to be a temple and is now under Muslim control. And this little dot of unrest today still sends out shockwaves that fill our media and our news in the Western world. Why? Something happened on that speck of land. And it still has ramifications today. And now I sit and I open the book. What was that city? What were they dealing with? He's writing from prison. Man, this is profound. No one ever showed me the story behind 27 books and how they all went together because of the journeys, because of the failures, because of the successes, because the men here who are slowly being killed for their faith are getting off one more letter, one more eyewitness account because you can chain me and you can kill me But you cannot chain and you cannot kill the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And 2,000 years later, we are part of the 28th book. It is being written right now through our story. You're invited to play a role. 
What a story. And I thought it was the most boring book in the world. <laughs> boring people had just taught it to me my entire life. <laughs> and no one showed me what he pulled off here. All the crowd should have left. They voted him to die. And if that stone wasn't rolled away, and if he didn't walk out, then what has caused this? And we're the next chapter. Father, may you allow us in the Ephesus and the Corinth that we live in today to hold on to your truth and to guard it. To not be swept away by what the world would want to add to the story or say is okay. But to hold on to a God that came to us because we couldn't come to you. Who showed us who he was through his power and miracles. So we could listen to his words, not be caught up in the actions. For showing us how you transform terrorists, runaway disciples, tax collectors, prostitutes, slaves. And change the world. May we be next in line. This weekend at North Coast. As we open up marriage and sexuality from Ephesus and Corinth. May you rock us. What role do we play? Because of your love. How do we love you back? So teach us how much you love us. So we can learn how to love you back. Continue this story through us. As a church, as North Coast, we ask, continue this story through us. In Jesus' name, amen.